if you are not a small scale farmer, maybe your parents are, maybe your aunts, your uncles, your relatives are small scale farmers, or your profession forces you to work with small scale farmers. So you know the magnitude of the challenge. There are so many issues we would like to put into context through this discussion in order to guide our leaders in the SADC. We are talking about industrialization, to industrialize the region. How do we industrialize the region whose population two thirds are living in the rural area? And when we talk of poor people, 80% of the poor people are small-scale farmers. So we are talking about a very sensitive group here. We would like to know, for example, who are they? We should not take it for granted that we know them. We should not think that we know who a small farmer is. Maybe through the discussion today, we'll be able to know who is a small-scale farmer. And what are the challenges facing small-scale farmers. And then in the discussion, I would love to hear, to hear what kind of pro poor policies can be put in place to transform small-scale farmers. We should not forget about the previous efforts that have been tried to transform farmers without success. We remember the Maputo Declaration where heads of states uh, decided to set aside 10% of their budgets to transform small-scale farmers. We have the CADIP. Has it really worked to transform the farmers? Should we continue pushing for it? Or what else can we do differently to make sure that we bring them on board? It will not be able to, 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 will not be able to develop the region if we don't have mechanism to bring these on board. Fortunately, we have six important people to take us through all these issues related to small-scale farmers. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speakers today. We will have three main speakers. The first one will be Honorable Dr. Abdallah Makame, who is the Member of Parliament, East African Legislative Assembly. He will be followed by our guest from South Africa, uh, Mr. Johansen Exten, from the Business Development and Marketing Manager, who is a, a Business Development Marketing Manager. And the third speaker will be, if available, uh, Natasha Malcolm, Global Marketing Manager, Digital Supply Chain Solution. These two speakers, or oh, three speakers will speak for 15 minutes. Please do us a favor and speak in 15 minutes so that we have more time for people to contribute. And then thereafter, we will have uh, four discussants in the panel. And uh, in the list, I have uh, Mr. Roman Marumalo, Mr. Timothy Mbaga, uh, Mr. Ma Mama Lefesane, Fakoe and Mr. Kalishas to Talife. For the interest of time, I would request each of the speakers to take the first one minute to introduce himself or herself so that people get to know him or her. Um, without further ado, you can see colleagues that uh, we have a terrific lineup here and uh, uh, Honorable Makame will go first. So please take the floor and proceed. Karibu. Just one minute to introduce ourselves. use a colleague who is here for the benefit because he's the only one, Honorable Mohammed Habib Mnya, who is also 
a member of the East African Legislative Assembly. Karibu sana mzee. Karibu ni sana and I hope we are going to have an interactive session. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. My name is Mamal Fezano Pawe. I come from Lesotho, a small scale farmer, a national chairperson, and a general secretary for Eastern and Southern Africa Small Scale Farmers Forum, and a member of Rural Women's Assembly. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Johan Ekstien. I'm from South Africa. I work for a global company called SGS, and we're into farmer development and supporting farmers in the value chain of uh, safe food and security in terms of uh, food safety. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Roman Marumero from Malawi. I coordinate the donors supporting agriculture sector as well as the donor group supporting the private sector development in Malawi. But from that, I'll bring in, I think, in this discussion, the perspective of donors harmonized investment, coordination, but also aligning their investment to the priorities of the country, of the region, and how they contribute to the industrialization. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Isaac Nyangaro from NMB Bank. I'm heading food, <clears throat> food and agri business uh, research and advisory services. Uh, glad to be here and we will uh, share and exchange ideas uh, from a commercial bank perspective and how that can also contribute towards the, uh, the theme of the, uh, of the subject today. Hello. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, panelists. It's good to be here and have this opportunity to discuss this very important topic uh, because, you know, it talks about agriculture, and in agriculture it talks about food, it talks about agro-processing, which is really key to our, to our survival. We cannot survive, we cannot industrialize without uh, making sure that first we have food to eat and we have the raw materials to put in the industries. And... Uh, The pre presentation is from subsistence farming to smart farming, SADIC's potential for disrupt disruptive change. But um, before we go into the details and uh, other things, uh, first of all, it's very important to remind ourselves what is subsistence farming. Because uh, we just have to, just a quick reminder, but uh, it says uh, when uh, it's uh, at a family level, a family. Uh, does a farming, a small scale, normally one acre, but not exceeding two acres, to feed themselves. And uh, usually they don't feed, they don't generate surplus. Or whatever surplus is, that is generated is uh, kept for use, for consumption during the year until the next uh, harvest period. And uh, the other thing which is a, a characteristic of subsistence farming is that uh, it does not generate profit. People... Uh, do the farming for subsistence. They do not trade. So it's mainly for subsistence and uh, survival. And uh, it is done at the rural areas because uh, usually rent is very low or free because uh, people have their own land. And uh, it's actually a very primitive method of, uh, not, I wouldn't say very primitive, but it's, a, it's not modern in a way such that uh, you don't get to higher integrate. Uh, you don't move to the next level of the value chain. You do not trade. So it locks you at the rural area without any potential of uh, further advancement. And uh, why does it fail? There are three reasons. Because it is susceptible to climate change. If there is drought, there is f floods, there is uh, anything to deal with climate, then uh, Subsistence farming will, uh, will, 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 will not yield positive results. Actually, you hear people going into hunger. And uh, also, 
uh, when you are anticipating that the rain will be coming and then the way the way rain is misbehaving now, so it's a deviation from the actual. You are focused on devi deviating from the actual. So it makes that uh, you don't have the food on the table. And uh, we say it's also a deterrent for development in the, in the rural area. And uh, what is smart farming now? Smart farming, as opposed to subsistence farming, according to FAO, FAO, Food Agricultural Organization, it is uh, farming management. That one isn't changed. Sorry, I mean, they're different. Anyway, smart farming is a, is a method of farming that uh, you use modern technology to generate more quality and uh, more quantity. And uh, farmers in the 21st century, they have access to GPS, they, have, uh, they, they can do soil scanning, they have data management, uh, they have access to internet and ICT, and uh, by using those, they can uh, use uh, pesticides and fertilizers more selectively to ensure that uh, they get uh, better yields and better results, and also they can use better seed, seed varieties to get uh, better yield of the, on their farm. And uh, also in this... Uh, Smart farming is when we also see the use of modern production technologies, the greenhouse and others. And uh, the techniques can better monitor individual animals in the, if you want to do some uh, livestock keeping so you can uh, adjust their nutrition corresponding and thereby you prevent disease and uh, you enhance the health of the livestock. Or if it is poultry, the lives of the poultry or if it's aquaculture, likewise. So it applies and cuts on the board. But uh, these are the painful facts I'd like to share. But these are facts to share with this audience about agriculture in Africa. One, it was also spoken here yesterday, uh, on Monday, sorry, during opening, that 60% uh, of the agri uh, Arab agricultural land is in Africa, is south of the Sahara. 60% of the Arab land in the world. But uh, we haven't made any of oh, the best use of it. So that is one. Two, despite the importance of the agricultural sector, almost a quarter of the African pe population experiences hunger quarter of the sub-Saharan in sub -Saharan Africa population. And uh, out of the 70, 795 people suffering from malnutrition or undernourishment in the world, 220 live in sub-Saharan Africa. And 23.2% uh, it, it is estimated that 23.2% uh, of the people in Africa of the world, 23.2 are in Africa that suffer malnourishment. That is the 220 people. And uh, also, we have uh, post-harvest losses in areas of abundance, usually maybe because due to lack of infrastructure access or preservation technologies and other things. And uh, despite, again, having that 60% of the arable land, and uh, agricultural potential, Africa remains a net food importer. It is very sad that we have all the land and we're importing food. Well, if you look at some countries in Middle East, and specifically maybe if you look at the uh, state of Israel, they export some food because they use uh, modern technology in agriculture. And uh, with, with us, we're having, we don't have to use even, I mean, some other formulated uh, uh, climate, we have natural climate, we have natural land, and uh, we are not making the best use of it. Uh, for the sake of use of this Kiswahili saying, they say, Penyemiti hapana wajenzi, that is the situation in Africa now. 
and uh, the role of smart agriculture and the digital agriculture, how can it improve yield? Uh, one, we can have improved extension services, and I, I decided here that we look at uh, two examples for extension services. Uh, there's a, an area in northern Tanzania and in, around the lake, lake, lake zone which goes into Uganda. They do cassava plantations. And uh, recently, even the bananas, there were some diseases which were affecting those crops. So we don't have so many extension officers on, on the ground because of lack of, uh, I mean, financing or maybe inadequate financing, I would say. And uh, most of them are located at the centers, but uh, the farm, uh, farms are remote, remotely located. And uh, they wanted to trace the effects of the cassava mosaic disease and cassava brain streak disease. And uh, they used mobile phone, and not really smartphone, but those uh, basic phones just to send a message. When you see signs of a disease to the center, and then they, they would dispatch the extension officers to come and uh, follow up. So just that basic technology, not, the, the, not with the internet, it helped to save the day. And uh, we see that uh, technology indeed helps to save. And uh, with the use of internet, then people can also be sharing some other additional information using smartphones. But uh, with this, even the basic one can, can help. And uh, the issue of market access, again, because we, we, we have seen the way people now are interacting more to at least uh, share the information on crops and uh, yield and harvest availability or animals availability. And it makes it easier for, for them to, to, to access the markets and trade. And uh, also financing. And uh, in the previous session, they were talking about science, technology, and innovation here. And uh, people are were saying and uh, really that we are not loading enough what we have done in area of science, technology, and innovation, especially our innovations. People are saying, I mean, patents have not been made and other things. But with the issue of mobile money, that is an African solution. You know, when you have a problem, that's when, where you find a solution. You don't find solutions where the problems are not there. So it's an African solution for providing mobile financing of, and mobile financing to transfer money from uh, one area to another. People are enjoying that facility and uh, mo mo many mobile companies are facilitating money transfers in Tanzania, in East Africa, in SADC, and uh, in other areas outside East Africa and uh, SADC. So basically, we are saying we are moving forward, but uh, also in terms of financing, We've seen uh, crop insurance coming and other innovative products coming outside the mobile financing. And I'm quite sure we have a colleague from the National Bank of Commerce here who's a panelist, and uh, he will chip in and give us more issues regarding that issues of uh, the area of mobile financing. But better use of information relating to soils, pesticides, and fertilizers, because uh, actually you see you get precise information and uh, you can uh, uh, use GPS, you can access internet, and uh, you can access experts who will give you more information and guide you accordingly. And uh, individuals and uh, institutions can share experience and information for better improving quality and quantity of yields, and uh, also better methods to organize into cooperatives and associations. You know, if we as countries in SADC we are now 16. We decided that we cannot face the, the, the global market individually, but we have to synergize and come collective. As nations, what about individuals and institutions at the grassroots levels? So it's the importance of synergy, it's the importance of moving together, it's the importance of cohesion, it's the importance of solidarity. So. The other area we were, uh, we were told to 
identifies to look at the key priority areas uh, in value chains and agro-processing. And actually, that was a bit of a challenge because determining a key uh, priority value chain for a single country would involve the research, uh, extensive consultations to determine, and to determine that for 16 countries, it is even more complicated. I remember here in Tanzania, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food Security and Cooperatives came with five food crops, sorry, five crops that they said we should uh, put them as a priority in the value chain. And uh, you, you, as you may know that Tanzania is the United Republic of Tanzania, and out of those five, there's none for Zanzibar. And Zanzibar really dies for, to see cloves being mentioned, but it was missing, and they say, hey, what's happening here? So if that is just here in Tanzania, now how would it be for SADC for 16 countries? And uh, you say we want to identify key priority areas. Actually, I think that should be an issue that uh, is a uh, member state uh, to determine, and they should use their policies, but they should really see to that, to it, that the value chains are supported from the lowest level to the highest level. Because uh, actually, from the discussions we had here and we've seen, is that uh, if we don't uh, develop these value chains accordingly and uh, appropriately, and we export semi-processed or unprocessed uh, agricultural produce outside Africa, then what we are doing is we are exporting jobs. And uh, many people have been discussing that uh, we are having booming youth and uh, the employment is really not growing to the same, le to the same level. So, and uh, at this juncture, I'd like to mention about the, the action plan for SADC industrialization strategy and roadmap which was adopted by the summit in 2017 in Lesotho. And uh, that encourages value chain development in agro-processing so as to make agriculture a precursor for industrialization. Our industries need raw materials that would be largely provided by agriculture. So it is very important. It is very important that uh, we link the two. We link the two so that uh, we, 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 we achieve our goals and the, the way we want to move forward. And uh, obstacles to smart farming and development in the, in the regional agricultural value chains. Here is uh, where we should uh, really focus on. And uh, one is the fact that uh, the, we, in Africa, at the AU level, we have the Maputo Declaration adopted by the summit, which calls for member states to invest or to have 10% of the annual budget spent in the agricultural sector. And uh, as a baby of the Maputo Declaration, we have the CADEP. The CADEP is the Comprehensive Af Africa Agricultural Development Program that aims to see implementation of the Maputo Declaration and further to have the sectoral growth of 6% per annum. Now, 16 years on, after Maputo, where are we? Is Africa walking the talk? Or are we just preparing policy statements and policy documents and, and then we're saying, now nah, we're having the Maputo Declaration. Anywhere you go, if you have a discussion on agriculture, food security, you'll hear issues of Maputo Declaration and SADC. We have the ESC Food Security Action Plan in East Africa. Much as this is SADC, but now, where is it? I'm a member of uh, the East African Legislative Assembly, and I'm very sorry to, to, to report here that even in ESC, we don't hear the issue of the Food Security Action Plan that was adopted by the summit even being mentioned uh, on the way of how we are progressing on implementing the Food Security Action Plan. The issue of uh, technical barriers to trade and uh, non-tariff barriers is also an issue that, uh, that uh, is really bothering people. Every time you hear in SADC, you hear in uh, the configuration which we have developed, uh, ESC, SADC, and COMESA, we call it the ESC, SADC, COMESA 
Trapatite or the Cape to Cairo initiative. NTBs are there. So we need to really work to, to resolve these NTBs and uh, TBTs. And the issue of land tenure, culture and mindset. You'll find in some societies, women are not uh, permitted to, to own land, but they are, the, they are the sector of the population that really work on the farms. That is the, 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 the fact. And uh, in some communities, you find the men leaving the women to, 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 to sow the farms, but when it comes to harvesting, they go to harvest, and then all the money is spent at the local clubs uh, consuming local, local brew. So that is something which uh, we really need to do and to work on and uh, to, to overcome, to empower our people to own, and especially women, and uh, more importantly, uh, to, to, to ensure that uh, they, they reap the benefit of the land. And uh, the other thing is uh, access to internet and access to electricity. Not all the population in the urban, oh, sorry, in the rural area can access internet. So it will be difficult to, for them to exercise smart farming and the electricity is a, is a, is a problem. We, it has been spoken in this for, forum we are having here many times, but uh, we also saw it during the opening that uh, there are some initiatives which are being taken. And uh, for example, here in the United Republic of Tanzania, there was a project for electrifying Tanzania, and uh, that would uh, really have a spillover to other member countries in the SADC. Uh, the project of uh, Rufiji uh, Basin Hydropower, uh, they call it Stiglas Gorge. It's going to generate more than 2,000 megawatts of electricity. So that project, after resistance from inside and outside pulling and pushing uh, is now in the implementation stage and we're hoping in the next uh, couple of months uh, that will be in the offing and uh, will really relief. Because you know, the, our competitors are not our member, sad, uh, member fellow member, SADC members, and are not ESC members, but members from outside Africa. And um, the moderator is uh, cautioning me to wind up, but. Uh, also the issue of infrastructure. And uh, we see that we need to access, uh, to, uh, I mean, rural areas which are producing are not being accessible by infrastructure and that's where post-harvest losses occur. And how to overcome obstacles? We should have the business unusual approach, not the business as usual. Eh? We have to agree that change begins with us. We have to come to uh, Resolution that we have done enough studies since independence, but we have not taken enough action. So it's time for action is now. We should commend I mean, initiatives like the one in Tanzania now, which was reported here, that uh, we, business environment strengthening, making business environment friendly to overcome over regulation and other things. And uh, also issues like heavy investments which are being, take, uh, are being implemented by Kenya and Tanzania. I would give an example, so the standard gauge railways and uh, internal trans, inter, intermodal transportation system, uh, whereby we, we, when uh, we go to Lake Victoria, we go to Lake Tanganyika, we use also the ports we, uh, from rail to port to rail or rail to port to road, we should uh, consider using uh, intermodal transportation system. And also improving the operations of trucks because uh, we saw issues of inconsistency in uh, transportation using trucks. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I'm very sorry for having exceeded the, mi the minute. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Makame, for breaking the ice. We now have pegs on which we can hang our different points. Uh, Dr. Makame has helped us to understand who subsistence farmers are, and uh, that we have many of them, and what we want. We want to transform these subsistence farmers into smart farmers. And we have seen the characteristics of smart farmers. 
those who are depending on ICT, uh, maybe irrigation, they are smart than subsistence farmers. That's what we want to see. Small scale farmers are going that way in our region. The question is how do we do that? And uh, through his presentation, he has highlighted some of the issues. I have heard him saying about improved extension services. And he has mentioned how that can be done and uh, improved market access, financing, prioritization of value chains, and so on. And uh, now I'd like to call upon uh, Mr. Johnson, John, Johan Exton to take the podium and share with us what he has for us in store. Please, you are welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I must say, before I start, I grew up on a farm, and I'm really talking with the heart of a farmer to you guys. I look much better in my farming clothes than in my black suit. And uh, for that reason, for me, it's a passion to talk about farming. And one of, one of my experiences was to work for three years in Uganda in the cotton industry, where we finance about 27,000 farmers. And it was a great experience, and we learned so much out of that experience. Um, so today, I want to talk to you about my company, SGS, and what we do in terms of uh, value chain and in terms of uplifting small farmers and helping towards food security. At SGS, for us, it's very important to get economies of scale for farmers, because if you don't have economies of scale, the farmer would never ever be on a commercial level in terms of the international or global arena. And it's very important for farmers to get there. And then the first question I always hear is, how does a small farmer get to that level? Because it is virtually impossible if you have one acre or half an acre that you work. Um, there is answers to those questions and I'm gonna try to address them. So in terms of to understand what the market arena in Africa is all about, we have to realize that a lot of the production is dispersed amongst a lot of small farmers, which in itself is a big problem because economies of scale is very difficult. Those small farmers um, have a problem to commercialize their farm because they don't have collaborative input management. In other words, they can't stand up in terms of volume uh, when they buy stuff and also when they sell stuff. And that doesn't make them a very important role player in the bigger picture. Um, farmers also have no ability to fight or to talk about commodity prices if they are such a small role player. And in terms of that, crop governing bodies has become a very important thing in Africa especially because the crop governing bodies is like the old cooperatives where um, they collaborate, they, they put the resources together and those farmers work as a group. So immediately the collaboration gives them more power. We see a lot of um, such examples in cocoa, in coffee, in cotton um, and various other products that I can name. But you all, uh, it's all the high value products but for so many other products there is no crop governing bodies and one of the things that needs to take place is we need to create longer value chains within the SADC production cycle. Um, the only way that we can do that is when we have tra transparency of what we produce. So I was very um, shocked this morning when I heard a gentleman say that um, we don't necessarily have to have the European standards. We don't have to comply to what the Europeans want. And that is a mistake because then we will only be subsistence farmers consuming everything that we can produce. We want to be a role play in the international markets and we can be that. There's no reason why we can't. Um, as, as the speaker before me said, we are such a, a, a rich in agricultural sector in sub-Saharan Africa. We are the food basket of the future and we need to get there. Um, the way we're going to do that um, is we've got to overcome these challenges. So one of the big challenges is our production uh, uncertainty. 
um, because we've got a fragmented market. So a lot of people come to our farmers and they want to sell inputs to them. So they've got all of these precision farming tools, but people are self-centered because they sell a, a product and they will promote their product. It is not a holistic a vision that the farmer get on how to fix his agriculture and how to have the best quality and quantity. Uh, we also see that um, the buying power of, of, of small farmers is very uh, limited and there is no direct access to markets. Now, farmers um, cannot negotiate prices uh, when they are limited to understand the market, but there are tools in the marketplace that can uplift these farmers and put them in, in the international market arena. We see various products um, sponsored by companies like Vodacom and MTN, where farmers are grouped. We see blockchain uh, coming uh, forward in Uganda, for instance, where uh, you, you've got a cell phone currency that you work with because farmers doesn't have access to cash. So all of these tools are fragmented and available all over the market arena, but it's not necessarily in one package. So what we do is we want to actually go forward and to benchmark uh, what we do in terms of our value chain. So our company doesn't supply any inputs or doesn't sell anything except we do testing, verification and certification. In other words, in terms of our precision farming services, you can see a chain up there, uh, starting with soil classification, it goes to soil analysis, um, it's water management, soil fertility, irrigation, planting, crop maintenance. So all of that, those services, is, is scientific services where we do the test and we do recommendations to the farmers. Um, we also geomap all the soil types and we will recommend the best use of land for that specific uh, farmer. And we also supply a mobile app where the farmer has a map of his whole farm and we can actually drop a pin on his premises to say to him on that point from the satellite images you've got a problem in your crop. Um, we also do site visits and we um, support the farmers in terms of going to them and meeting up with them. Once again, there's the full supply chain that we do only on precision farming. Um, the next thing that I want to touch on is now that we've maybe fixed the farming, we need to say to each other what, what is happening in the marketplace internationally. So the way people shop has changed so dramatically and the regulatory pressures on what the quality of food should be has changed. So businesses are held ac accountable for the su full supply chain. What does it mean to us? It means that people won't touch products that they can't trust and they can't trace. It's very important. So if you want your beans to be in a can on the shelves of a European uh, supermarket, they need to know whether it was produced safely. And for that reason, we are talking about the knowledge um, of the complete supply chain. We're also talking about compliance to basic standards and the flexibility to capture this data and to structure efficiencies and analyzing that data. So that is all available and I'm not standing here and giving you a big dream of some wishy-washy thing that I thought of before I went to bed. We actually do this and it's available to the farmer. So the question would rather be why doesn't the farmers uh, already implement and use this? Yes, there are a lot of farmers that use this. Sorry, my slide just... There we go. So in Europe, uh, for instance, they would use a phone and they would scan the can of beans that I spoke about, and it will tell you all the tests that happened, all the producers in the process, and everything that happened on that farm. Um, and then obviously what is happening in terms of uh, the quality standards throughout the supply chain. So people want to know what they eat and where it comes from. Um, the system that uh, SGS has is called Transparency One. So all the different role players in the supply chain 
all the steps that they do can be uploaded onto this. So when you scan your product, you can have all this information right at hand as a consumer. And this is where the world is moving towards. Us in Africa, we need to realize that if we're going to become the food basket of Africa, of, of the global world <laughs> out there, uh, we, need to, we need to see the supply chain as a long interlinked chain. We can't be only farmers. We can't only be commodity traders. We have to be part of the whole scheme. So in terms of what SGS does is we do um, the inspection, the testing, audits, training, and also advisory services in the whole supply chain. Then we upload it to our one system. So what we, what we are suggesting is from a SGS side, we want to get more involved in terms of our precision farming services to help to verify and certify the food value. Um, so once you have that food value chain certified, you've got a great basis to start up this whole food security chain going forward into the markets. Then as SGS, we would also uh, suggest to SADC to map a lot of these value chains. So in other words, if we can say a lot of fish is produced in this country and it goes to that country and this is where the value add takes place, then we can stimulate uh, the expansion of processing facilities within the SADC region. As uh, far as longer supply chains is, are concerned, it's really what, what we should be looking at within SADC. We don't want our raw products to go outside of our SADC and be processed and value added there because that is where we lose a lot of our GDP and that is where we lose a lot of uh, job creation and prosperity for our own people. So our ultimate goal should be to process our farm goods within the SADC regions. Um, our transparency one uh, system, and sorry, I just went too fast here. Uh, the transparency one is literally, if, if we deliver those services, we can come up from the bottom, from a farmer's level, and we can literally say to those users of that product in Europe or wherever, Asia, wherever you export to, this is where your product uh, came from, this is who handled it, and this is the quality that you can expect in that can. Um, and there's nothing extra in terms of uh, what the farmer should do. Those systems are available. So for me, because anything that sounds too big um, scares farmers off, and it sounds like it is something that is very impossible to achieve. So I had to break it down and say, okay, in terms of precision farming, what's the target market and who will pay for this? And my conclusion is if Southern Africa or uh, sub saharan Africa is really the food basket of the future, then we should get these global value chains involved in helping our farmers and also helping in terms of um, getting that value chain uh, transparency up and running within Africa as well, because that is the way we can globalize our, our production in agriculture. Um, how would we approach this? Uh, we want to group the different product, uh, product movements within the SADC region and exports so we can see what value lies where and how does it move around. So um, part of our Transparency One product is it will actually map a product as simple as that can of beans and tell you this is where the salt came from, that is where the water and this is where the fish came from that was in that can and this is how, it, how long it ago it was caught out at sea. Um, if we, if once we have that, we can also determine what the product movement within the SADC region is. And if you can do that, we can source and we can uh, collaborate in terms of value add. In other words, we promote um, value uh, processing within the region. Um, in terms of training, certifying and verifying quality, it's all the the services that are available in the market, but it means nothing to the small farmer if he doesn't have uh, the, the, the end market. So he would rather consume his product than to sell it to some middleman who takes it to some auction floor who 
eventually makes more than the farmer himself. So it's important that the farmers are helped to start verifying and certifying the quality that they produce because that quality then becomes an international role-playing commodity. And that is the way we can uplift our farmers in terms of what they do as small farmers. So if you look at the whole SADC region quickly, um, there's so many things that are exported, but it's really grouped into very big product groups. And this is one of the things that um, my project uh, is all about, is to actually say, okay, if Namibia produces a lot of fish, um, does it go to Botswana or does it go to Angola or where does that fish go? And who processes that fish and how much value do we add in terms of that to earn international currencies? Um, we can do that, we can keep ourselves busy for a few days on that because the export values are available on all the trade networks, but it's quite an extensive exercise. But once you've done that, you know exactly where the opportunity lies in terms of value adding. So our, our proposal to SADC is to take it in a step-by-step -step process where we identify f initial first few countries and the initial list of commodities. And those commodities and countries will map in terms of what happens within SADC. Um, this is just a suggestion, but uh, we're open for you know, changing around the commodities and the, the, the countries, because at the end of the day, it is where the most value lies, where you want to approach first. Um, if we look at in terms of commodities, and this is what is so extremely um, mind-boggling to the farmer, this is just in terms of commodities, in terms of testing and inspection services that happens to a certain commodity. Let's take wheat or maize or whatever. All of those things happen to that product. And for that reason, the farmer is excluded from that value chain, which is not necessarily needed, needed to happen. So once again, there's also audit uh, and certification and market intelligence happening on commodities. If you look at food specifically, there's uh, testing of the food, there's inspection of that food, and all of those things that you see there is really things that happen in the background where the farmer is not um, actually uh, part of the process. Also auditing, technical solutions, and so on. So what we are saying is all of this information is really uploaded onto our Transparency One um, platform, and when the user opens it up and he knows anything about food auditing or certification. Uh, let's see, say he wants to go to see if this, uh, this producer is a global gap producer. He can go in there, he can uh, look at the certificate and he knows that this is produced under global gap. In other words, under good agricultural practices where the workers are looked after, where everything is in place in terms of good agricultural practices. So our motto is um, when you need to be sure. So people need to be sure what they eat. They need to also be sure that what they produce has value in the market. And this is exactly what we are trying to do in, in, in our precision farming and our agri-food and lifestyle businesses. And my role as a business development manager for Africa is to actually see that we can bring more money at farm level and make the farmers not consumers but producers of commodities. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Joan, for that nice presentation. Dear colleagues, I think you can see a clear line of linkage between the presentation by Dr. Makame and also the presentation by John. It was, uh, Dr. Makame uh, introduced the issue of smart farmers. And uh, uh, John has shown us a practical way of creating smart farmers. How do we assist the smart farmers so that they become smart? Agricultural value chain is very long with so many nodes, uh, so uh, the message from John is that they have decided to intervene by developing value chains. They develop value chains 
and specifically they are in the area of um, uh, certification and compliance. They make sure that they prepare farmers to comply with the requirements of lucrative markets in Europe. They give them certificates. Here maybe he's referring to the issue of traceability. Uh, that is a requirement before you export in the UE market, the issues of quality and so on. So that is um, uh, Joan. Thank you very much for uh, highlighting on these issues. Now, can we put our hands together for our two presenters, please? Thank you so much. Now, um, we have uh, Mr. Caro from uh, the National Bank of no, NMB Bank, because he said he wants to leave. I just want to give him uh, an opportunity to speak first, and then you can leave thereafter. You are welcome, please, to contribute. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the opportunity and I have to apologize uh, because there were prior commitments. So I am, I'll be very brief and echo to what my colleagues have already uh, said and perhaps add a few things and maybe a couple of thoughts around it. To start with, uh, I, want to, I want every one of us to think about this very carefully. Uh, we are talking about a region that has over 340 million people meaning SADC region, and at the same time, uh, we, we have about 39 to 40% of the population that is living in urban places. So it is not a small thing. And from a commercial perspective, this says a lot in terms of the seriousness that needs to, to be put in place so that we really, really walk the talk, as uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Makami said. So it is, it is not a small matter. It's also about livelihood, because we are talking about 60% of the population that is living in the rural areas, and we should be concerned that it, there, there's no, you know, some you know, very strong development in terms of supporting that transformation. At least in, in the last one decade, there are a couple of spots where you could see there are areas where there's really development. Now let's get the basics right. This is an investment decision which either a country or an entrepreneur or any stakeholder that is involved within that sector has to make. And it's, it's about getting also the, those basics right. It's not a political agenda because most people live in the rural areas now. It is not a help, as it, 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 it sounds, because it is, you know, moving the smallholder to a smart farmer. It sounds like you're helping somebody. This is an investment decision which a smallholder farmer has to make, supported by the respective governments, and making sure that all ingredients are in place, or at least substantial amount of support is available to see this transition taking place. And therefore, I think, in my opinion, markets will be number one priority. And it has already been mentioned by one speaker here that the, we have a bigger region that we're looking at. The inter-regional, inter inter, you know, between countries trade should be a critical aspect or something that needs to be deliberated within in the course of these meetings. Are we really taking off the red tapes? Are we helping or facilitate the movement of goods from one country to another so that the very small holder, that is by majority, over 60% that live in South, uh, sorry, 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 the Sadak region, depends on it. You need the bank to be sure that if they lend money, if there's capital given out, they are able to track between the commodity that is being produced and the cash that went out so that there's a net effect of repayment at the end of the day, and the smallholder makes money and reinverts back on the technology and other things. If that is not happening, it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of it's something to think about. 
The second block that I think is most important is actually the financing, which I've already mentioned. So that financing will catalyze the whole process. What um, uh, SGS is doing, that will require a bit of financing. Donors will never be there forever. What everybody else is thinking in the room about the smallholder helping, supporting, encouraging, empowering, that requires a bit of financing. It could be own equity, or it could be a loan from a bank, or it could be any support that is available in the market. So it's very important that these things are packed together and lead to a total solution around getting this farmer that we're talking about to a smart farm. And the third most important thing is technology. So we've seen a lot of inventions uh, of recent. You know, the payment solutions, which originated from Kenya. Well, now, you know, it's, it's a world phenomenon. We've seen uh, the digitization of the warehouses, mostly in the southern part of Africa, uh, where it's high tech and a player within the chain can be able to track and know how many kilos are in, in X warehouse. Can I get financing, financing for that very amount of kilos? And so forth and so forth. These three things are very important. If we really have to address the issues around the 60% of the population that lives in, in the SADC region. And I think, in my opinion, the governments have a bigger role to play in terms of setting the policies right and much more predictable. And we have evidence where in some of the value chains in this, in this country, in Tanzania, for instance, they have developed organically without a donor support. And it is very possible. It is locally generated because all instruments are in place. And it is possible to allow investors, including the smallholder, to save some amount of money because markets are improved, so they make better margins, because the storage facilities are better, so they are not afraid that their maize or beans or rice or anything else they store, be it in a cold room, will be destroyed in the next six months. So they can really work around better prices along the season. Because of technology, they can know on time what the price is prevailing in the market, what seed they need to use, where is the cheapest source of that seed, what price do they need to pay for. And in this case, the regulation becomes most important because otherwise, you get other people running over other people. Before you know it, the whole thing is distorted. So it has to be predictable in terms of markets. You know, if I invest in a small farm of five acres, I, I need to be sure that the market I got will never be disrupted by bad policies. It's a matter of practicalities. So uh, based on that, I believe and I think and looking at it from a commercial angle, if the three things are put in place, then the rest will definitely grow organically. There will be an appetite for SGS to really invest more in technology and invent more solutions because there is predict predictability. There will be interest from the financial institutions to come up with more solutions that reach out to those uh, unbankable populations, health, agriculture, uh, you know, the, the crop insurance, all these things always follow a stable ecosystem. And probably that will be my last comment, and thank you very much, Mr. Moderator, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Carl, for that brief presentation. Um, that has added value to the ongoing discussion. Uh, what I've got from you is that uh, inter-regional trade is the best way forward if we want to assist these farmers. We must open up the borders so that farmers can sell their crops wherever they want. And actually, if we remove these red tapes in inter-regional trade, we can unlock so many issues, so many challenges facing the farmers including financing. Because banks would like to put money where they are assured that the cash flow will allow them to get the money back. So these are the issues that the uh, uh, government of, of the Sadiq region must consider uh, seriously. The policies must be consistent so that um, decisions can be predictable and so on. These are very good points. Thank you so much, Carol. Now you can leave if you want.
Okay, can we put our hands together for him as he lives? Thank you so much. Now, I would just want to give an opportunity to our discussants to, take, uh, to give us inputs into what they have heard so far. We have um, the first speaker, Mr. Roman Marumaro. Mr. Roman Marumaro, with the coordinator of private sector development donor group, Malawi. Can you please take the floor, please? Proceed. Thank you, the moderator. Just to make the name pronunciation accurate, I am Roman Marumero, but I'm not from Rome. I'm from within the region. <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I coordinate the donors to make sure that there is coordinated and harmonized support to agriculture, but at the same time, private sector development. I'm sure you would believe me, with me, one of the saying which says, if you want to run far, you run alone. I mean, if you want to run fast, you run alone. But if you want to run far, you run in a coordinated manner. And that's a principle the development partners thought of. And this is in line with the CADE principles, the Paris Declaration principles, which is saying the development partners, those supporting different initiatives, they have to bring it on board in a coordinated manner so that there is complementarity, there is synergy. And Malawi is one of the countries, I think here in Africa, another one is Ethiopia, I know well, and Malawi, where the donors, they are together within the sector to make sure that there is coordinated investment. So they decided to establish a secretariat as a hub of information, but also to manage the database so that if the private sector want to tap from the donor resources, they could access through that secretariat, engaging the government between joint partners, go through that office. Anyway, we can talk a lot as, as a model, but maybe as a message at regional level, I haven't heard of that happening. How do we bring the development partners to make sure that what they support at regional level is coordinated. If we are talking of integrated approach, all these value chains, why are we leaving the development partner support scattered? Probably it's a million dollar question the static secretariat will have to consider in the few future. Let me quickly also mention the flagship of the development partners as they support to help the farmers move from subsistence to more commercial. The development partners support successful policy and regulatory development and implementation. They also, also support infrastructure development. There was a colleague here from African Development Bank yesterday who was proud to say African Development Bank have supported infrastructure development like the corridor itself, uh, the roads. But another flagship is also the capital investment in the markets, the commodity exchanges. Another one is access to finance. Probably we would pay more attention to this. How do donors support access to finance? This is through risk sharing facilities where they engage with the commercial banks and then the farmers could access the credit, but also credit facility itself, the matching grants, but also capital investment into the development banks. Some countries are moving into establishing a capital, I mean a development bank, and development partners are coming in to support feasibility studies, even injecting the capital itself into the, into, into the bank itself. But all this is happening with a thinking to shift the paradigm of the farmers from where it is common now to say, let's get the money to do something. But rather to say, let's do something to get the money. And now the money becomes a catalyst. Those who are already motivated, those who are already inspired to move into agriculture as a business. Now, based on the presentations that have been made, I would like to make quick comments in terms of the obstacles that have been mentioned. Dr. Abdullah mentioned about the CADAP, which was uh, endorsed by the heads of states. It was been adopted. Now it is shifted into Malabo declaration. But the key question comes in is, how much are we achieving from such commitments? Now, I will zero it down in terms of the country level. What are the, some of the obstacles which the development partners and the government needs to engage more? First and foremost is in terms of the policy framework. How the countries 
develop the policies and the regressions looking into the long-term perspective versus the short-term investments. It is not a matter of how many trillions of dollars is invested in the subsidy, but rather it's a matter of how strategic is that investment to drive growth, to accelerate the market development. And that's where the key concern is, and probably a big ob obstacle. But similarly also on the same, on the policies, the political will. If we have policies in place, they are endorsed and they are launched. How do we gain the political will? Yesterday we had a good panelist here of the ministers. It was pleasing to note that they said there is a political will. But probably the next question would be, how is that political will translated into resource allocation, into strategic areas? And how is that political will translated into the messages they deliver at a platform? Do they focus on the quick wins today? because it's a year of elections versus a five year, a 10 year, 15 year, 25 years investment. That's where we need probably to strike the balance. And by the end of the day, to achieve value for money. Another obstacle, probably I'll just mention only two obstacles. There's a long list, but I would mention one which I've, I've seen that it hasn't come out probably quite prominent in the discussion here, I expected probably one paper to focus on this obstacle which I'm going to mention. And I believe after mentioning it, I'll receive a loud of applause for those, those who are gender activists and women around the room. It's the issue of investments towards women and youth economic empowerment. Studies have shown that 70% of the farmers in the region, in the developed countries, are women. And they, they are in the supply chain. But what are the approaches doing? They have got limited access to land, limited access to extension services, limited access to skills. It's like we are having a very good team of players. And we are saying, okay, to build up a good team to win, let's have a whole team be comprised of only defenders, assuming men we are defenders. And then we assume that we are going to win. No, it needs integration. And that's where the elements of how do we invest into the women empowerment, so that they access their skills, they access the, the, the services, and they access the, even the credit. This is one of the key drivers as an obstacle. So in summary, in conclusion, what I would say is, all the policies, all the processes, the investment we make, they have to build in terms of how we address these key obstacles. The policies themselves, but at the same time, integrating the drivers of the economy, who are the women, the youth, before this session, there was an interesting one which was talking about innovations. And it was good to see an acknowledgement to say the youth are becoming more innovative, even using their available limited tools to become more innovative. If we take opportunity to empower them more, are we not going to achieve more? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Who is this? Roman, for that uh, uh, interesting contribution. There are so many messages from your presentation, but the key message is that um, um, if you want to move fast, go alone. And uh, if you want to go far, go with the others. Now, it seems um, if you want to go with the others, then it's not the matter of subsidy, but is it smart subsidy? Is it strategic? These are the issues that you have to ask yourselves. That's why maybe the CADIP that uh, Dr. Makami mentioned has not worked. So this is one issue that you, uh, we need to think seriously as we consider uh, challenges facing farmers. Thank you very much. Now uh, we go straight to the second uh, speaker, Mr. Timoth Mbaga, director. He's not there. Okay, we can go to the next. Mama Fastsane Fakoe, please take the floor and contribute. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, during, my, during the introductions, 
I said I am a small-scale farmer. Before I continue with my first in here are farmers. Can you raise up your hands, please? Thank you, thank you, thank you. The reason why I'm asking how many of you are farmers here is because in most cases, in the spaces like this ones, you may find that uh, we, 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 people will be talking about farming without farmers. And as I am a farmer, we have a motto which says there is nothing for a farmer without a farmer. And we also say farmers speak for themselves. Back to the point. I would like to know why in the first place are we, are we farming as farmers? We are growing crops and keeping animals for food and raw materials. The question, the second question will be, why do we eat? Why do we eat? To nourish our bodies and our souls to survive. Today we are talking about a very critical issue, which is food. And we mustn't uh, uh, compromise that food for the business sake. We must admit it that most of the rural women, like I said, I'm from the Rural Women's Assembly, are small-scale farmers practicing subsistence farming because they are the ones who are feeding the families. And we are saying, today we are gathered here to talk, to talk about how we can um, move from subsistence farming to commercial farming. Now from the Rural Women's Assembly perspective, we are saying there is no way. There is no way we can do away with subsistence farming. People must be taught to produce what they eat or eat what they produce. Because for us, eating is not just to fill our stomachs. It involves the issues of health. And with commercial farming, there are so many implications which are negative, negative implications with the subsistence farming. The use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. And it is not true that uh, commercial uh, farming is uh, increasing the yields. It's not true. We have seen that ever since there is an introduction of this commercial farming, many countries, including mine, the yields have deteriorated like anything else. I am from Lesotho. Lesotho used to be food secure. So much that we are practicing subsistence farming. So much that we are able to sell the surplus to South Africa, which is our only neighboring country. We are feeding the Kimberley mine with our cereals. But ever since someone, I don't know from where, introduced the commercial farming, we are living on handouts now from other countries. In March, it was announced that it was, during the, the, the national budget speech, it was announced that uh, 591,000 people were in hunger. But as we speak only last month, 
the number increased to 700,000. Just in a matter of three months in between. And we are still encouraging the people to practice the, the commercial agriculture. As small scale farmers, we just need to be supported financially or to have access on finance. Unfortunately, our governments are failing us. In that, for an example, we, in most of the African countries, we have what we call the thesis. It's, it's a farming input subsidy programs in our countries, which uh, were supposed to be helping the small scale farmers in the rural areas to improve their conditions there so that they are able to improve their productions. However, the very same subsidy programs is benefiting the multinational companies where they are buying the so-called hybrid seeds, chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. As if we don't have our own indigenous seeds in our countries. So what we see as the, 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 the challenges for small scale farmers is the rise of corporate control of the, the whole food chain from seed and land to processing and distribution. Increasing land grabs environmental devastation, de devastations that deeply impact on soil quality and food production and contributing to the changing, to the changing climate conditions. Rising patterns of violence against women that are coming alongside the erosion of land's rights by agricultural and extractive corporations and the destruction of peasant agriculture, agriculture and the wholesale destruction of nature. The failure of many of our governments to support the needed land tenure reform, especially the strengthening of women's land rights, deepening the rural poverty and rising inequality across the region. Smart agriculture has to be, has to use the human rights based approach if ever we have to change from subsistence to smart agriculture. It has to be inclusive for small scale farmers in the decision making and implementation. And it has to acknowledge and include small-scale farmers' indigenous knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Mama Le your name is so difficult. Mama Mama Okay, Madam Fakoe, thank you very much for that nice contribution. I like her contribution, and she has balanced the discussion, as you can see, in many ways. First, she has spoken on behalf of the farmers, because normally when we meet here, we are already brothers and sisters. But uh, she has speak, spoken as a farmer. That was the first balance. But also, she has spoken as a woman. So that's another balance. That the most, most critical balance is the last issue of challenging the notion that we have to transform subsistence farmers into smart farmers. This is very critical. And she has challenged all of us um, to think differently. Uh, she suggests that um, uh, subsistence farmers 
should be supported. I don't know to remain the way they are or whatever, but um, uh, she says even the support that comes to, 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 uh, for, to, to the farmers, they don't benefit the farmers. They benefit multinational companies that sell modern seeds and inputs. Yeah. She forgot to mention maybe even government officials uh, through elite captures, like who benefit from subsidies. Maybe if she had the time, she could have talk, uh, talked about that. So she also uh, suggests support through land tenure and the involvement, and the instrumental involvement, really involvement in decision making. I like her contribution. It is challenging us to continue thinking about these issues. We thought it is a simple thing. It is not simple. The people we are trying to fight, to liberate, they don't see it that way. We have to convince them why they should become smart farmers, not remain subsistence farmers. So as I give you time to contribute, I will give you time to contribute, you must be able to help her, convince her that actually she needs to become a smart farmer. Yeah? Okay, we have one last speaker before I open up the discussion to the, yeah? Finish it? We are done. Ah, okay, we are done. Now I can open up uh, for questions. Please take the questions. You will have to respond to these questions at a later stage. Be very brief so that we can have many people contributing to this. Karibu. Well, thank you very much. My name is Frederick Fusi. I'm the CEO of ChangeLab Consulting. I would love to commend Dr. Makame for such a brilliant and very good presentation. Uh, you, men you mentioned, uh, actually all the speakers actually, you, you, you had good uh, presentations of this session. Uh, in your presentation, Dr. Makame, you mentioned the six obstacles of uh, smart farming. And I think uh, we can even add the seventh one which is, uh, the first one you said it, it is the, uh, the implementation of the Maputo Declaration, allocating 10% of national budgets for agriculture. And another obstacle which I see, this session is, is very important, but unfortunately it was allocated a time at an 11th hour, this time. And this is, what, is one of the reasons, and it is an evidence that agriculture in Africa, in SADC, is not been given an attention and that priority that we think it should be given. Now, I didn't expect to have very brilliant and very amazing thoughts on, uh, on, on, on smart farming in your presentation. I would have loved to listen to your presentation in the morning instead of an 11th hour. So this also is also an evidence that we do not put value in agriculture. But also I commend the presentation of, 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 of Johan uh, your presentation is amazing, but I have one question for you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, park country program that you're implementing in the SADC region, and you mentioned in Tanzania you're doing uh, a program for coffee, fruits, and veggies. So I would love to know and learn further from you. Uh, what is the progress of these programs in Tanzania? And if you, you would allow me, because uh, this is an 11th hour, I will come and exchange my business card with you, and I also take yours, so you can answer me that question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sana. Yep. We will take several questions before I allow them to respond. Any other contribution? Yeah, please. Please. Okay, Karib. Asante Sana. Mimi taongea kiswahili. E, kwanza napenda ni shukuru kwa meza kuu pamoja na presentation zote zilizo ongelewa hapo. Kwangu mimi naona kama ni fursa. Wa Tanzania sasa tumekuwa na fursa. Mimi naitwa Said Godfrey Simkonda, natokea shirika la The Wina Mwanga Cultural Heritage Association wilaya ya Kisalawe kwa Wapwani. Tumekuwa na, na project tangu mwaka F2016 mpaka leo na tuna, tu, tumejenga vikundi kuvijengea uwezo vikundi 27 wanachama kama 850. Nimefurahi kukutana kwanza leo na hii presentation kwa sababu inawezekana ikawa ndio tatizo la kuweza kwa kuleta maendeleo mazuri. Kwamba 
kumekuwa hello kumekuwa na tatizo katika uzalishaji wa mazao ya kilimo hasa wakulima wa vijijini e, mpango wetu wa kwanza tumeweza kuwawezesha wananchi kwanza walikuwa hawana umiliki wa mashamba kwa hiyo vigezo vya kukopesheka hata kibenki walikuwa hawana sifa sasa sasa hivi tayari tumeshawa support na kuweza ku, kuamilikisha mashamba wanachama wasiopungua na hamsini wilaya ya Kisalawe kwa kushirikiana na halmashauri ya wilaya ya na sasa tunatarajia kuzalisha tani 1013 na 500 kutoka kwa hawa wananchi kuna mashamba ya aina mbili kuna mashamba ya ekali ya msini kwa kila mwananchi mmoja lakini pili kuna mashamba ya ekali kumi kushuka chini lakini tatu kuna mashamba ya ekali mbili mbili elimu tunayoifundisha ni kuanzia mkulima aliyekuwa anazalisha kama alivyotangulia kusemaje msemaji mama hapo kutoka lesoso kwamba mkulima aweze aweze kutoka kwenye walau tani moja kwenda paka tani mbili hichi ndio kilimo tunachokihitaji tumefanya research wilaya ya Kisalawe asilimia kubwa wakulima wa Tanzania hawajawahi kupata gunia zisizo anzia tani tatu paka tani mbili kila mkulima unayemuuliza anakwambia mimi ni kilima napata gunia tano sasa sasa hivi tume, tume, tumefanya training za kuwafundisha good agriculture GAP unaona mafunzo ambayo kwetu sisi tunataraji kuona kwamba anaweza kuleta ma, 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 anaweza kuleta tija. Kwa hiyo tuna tulikuwa tunauliza swali moja kwa 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 kwa, kwa, kwa mwezeshaji kutoka SGS. Tunataka kuweza kupata chat cha SGS J. SGS mtakuwa tayari kuja kushirikiana nasi eh kuweza kuwawezesha hawa wananchi katika kupata mafunzo ya ya, ya, ya uzalishaji bora na utunzaji bora wa haya mazao ili yaweze kukizi viwango vya kimataifa na kwenda kwenye soko la la, 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 la nje e, lakini swali lingine litakwenda kwa mheshimiwa makame mheshimiwa tunapenda kwanza kwanza napenda kushukuru sana napenda kushukuru sana kwa uwepo wako lakini sasa wakati wetu mwafaka tumeona ni huu kwenye kwenye upande wa, wa hizi tani tumeweza kuweza kufanya ni kilimo cha mkataba tumewafundisha negotiation masuala ya kubargain bei na nini na kila kitu ili mradi mkulima asiweze kuhangaika na soko kwanza la ndani soko la ndani bado hatujaweza kulifikia viwango kwa soko la ndani tukiweza kulifikia tunajua sasa huyu anayenunua mazao anayapeleka wapi yana ubora gani kwa sasa sisi kama shirika kwa kushirikiana na wataalamu wa halmashauri ya Kisalawe tulichokiona sasa hivi kupitia shirika letu tulikuwa tunatafuta mtaji wa kuweza ku, ku, kununua equipment ambayo itakuwa ni plant ambayo tuta installation pale kijiji cha Gwata kwa sababu halmashauri ya kijiji cha Gwata tayari wameshatupatia wamesha eneo lenye ukubwa ekali ya msini. ambapo pale tumeplani kuweka mitambo ya aina mbili mtambo wa kwanza ni maize milling liner ambayo utakuwa na uwezo ku wa kuprocess mazao hayo ya wakulima kutoka tani kwa yani kwa masai 24 rice milling liner pamoja na ku grade kila kitu wenye uwezo wa tani ya 50 kwa masai 24 sasa kwa kuwa mheshimiwa huko hapa meza kuu je unaweza ukatusaidia kuweza kupata mtaji wa kuweza kulipia hizi equipment kwa sababu tayari tumesha request hata huko kampuni za nje China mitambo yenye viwango vya ISO ili tuweze kukizi soko la Sadek kwa sababu tunaashumu kwamba katika uzalishaji wa awamu ya kwanza tutakuwa na uwezo wa kuzalisha hizo tani 1013 lakini kwenye phase 2 2021 tunatarajia kuongeza uzalishaji kufikia tani 1030 kutoka mazao ya mpunga, alizeti, mahindi pamoja na, na, na kuchakata mafuta ya alizeti. Kwa sababu katika mpango tulionao, huu mtambo wa maize milling liner 
una uwezo wa ku Waku, waku chakata tena yani yale mahindi yana yatatoa product tatu punje moja ya mahindi itakuwa na uwezo wa kutoa asilimia saba mpaka tisa ya mafuta ya mahindi kwa tumeona kwamba ni ili kuweza ku, 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 kuongeza value chain ya ya mazao sio kuyachukua tu afu mkulima ana package na yanakwenda nje kwa hiyo tumeona kwamba sisi kama shirika tumeshawafundisha kilimo bora lakini changamoto walionayo ni mitaji na lakini benki NMB walikuwa tayari kuweza kutoa mkopo sasa kidogo kwa sababu tuna mashamba ya aina mbili kuna mashamba mapya ambayo ni, 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 ni mashamba pole yanahitaji equipment ambazo zitaweza ku, ku, kungoa vile visiki lakini pamoja na mashamba ambayo tayari yanalimwa e, kwenye upande wa, 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 wa uwezeshaji so pH so pH nao yara Tanzania Limited wao wamekubali wame, wame kuingia mkataba na sisi na wako tayari kupima kumpimia kila mwananchi ambao ni mwanakundi kumpimia shamba lake ule udongo na kuweza kujua shamba udongo ule unahitaji mbolea ya aina gani kwa tumekubaliana nao na wao wako tayari kwa changamoto tulionao ni mashamba hayo aina mbili hasa mashamba makubwa ambayo yanahitaji yana, yana kusafishwa kwanza je mheshimiwa makang utatusaidiaje sisi wananchi wa Kisalawe kupitia ili shirika letu ili hao wananchi waweze kuyaandaa haya mashamba kwa kipindi hiki cha mwaka 2019-20 kwa kuwa tayari wameshaanza kusaini contract na mnunuzi atakaye nunua hayo mazao kwa sababu watu wa bankers walikuwa wamesema tuko tayari kutoa mikopo cha kwanza mkulima awe na hati cha pili awe na contract, contract business farming ambayo tayari ile contract business farming inakwenda kumgrant kwamba NMB au CRDB atakuwa tayari kutoa ule mkopo kwa sababu tayari anaye nunua yale mazao anamjua atakuwa ameingia mikataba na watu watatu ambaye atakuwa ameingia mkataba na groups atakuwa ameingia mkataba na mnunuzi na yeye mwenyewe mkopeshaji kwa maana ya kwamba anajua mazao yale huwa kwa kawaida wana wana wanalipa wana mwisho mwishoni mwa mwa, mwa, mwa mwa msimu wa manunuzi ya yale mazao. Kwa mnunuzi analipa kwenye akaunti ya kile kikundi. Sasa kwa, kwa, kwa mafunzo haya yote tayari tumesha ya kamirisha na leo ujaji wa hapa nilikuwa naisubiri sana hii hii hi, hi program ya agri business ili kuweza kujua kwamba kilio chetu sisi kama shirika kwa kwa tayari tushatumia hela nyingi na serikali inaweza ikatusaidiaje kupitia mifuko yake ya uwezeshaji kwa niaba wananchi wa wilaya Kisalawa lakini pili na kwa niaba ya Sadek pamoja na Tanzania kwa sababu kitakachozalishwa pale kitakuwa kimeenda kuitangaza bendera ya Tanzania lakini na Sadek kwa ujumla tayari tutakuwa na uwezo kukupeleka product zetu zenye viwango vinavyokubalika na SGS lakini vinavyokubalika na ISO Asante ni yetu Asante sana tumekupata vizuri thank you very much uh, I, I think we should end up here how do you find it do you still have energy to continue? <laughs> okay, two more. Ladies first. Okay, Karib. My name is Dina Bina. I, I'm from Dina Flowers Company Limited and also a member of Tanzania Women Chambers of Commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for the many presentations, very valuable presentations uh, that have been given this evening. Uh, my, my question or my observation goes to what Madam Fakoye presented. I, I sat down and thought exactly what she meant. And what I'm thinking is, what she's aiming at is for us to stay organic with our natural preservatives and natural um, things that we have been using but go commercial. Because what I've seen recently, a lot of countries, Europe and other places, they want to come to Africa to get things that have been organically uh, produced. Even some people are looking for some cows from, say, from Tanzania, from Dodoma, that have been grazing naturally. They say that's the best beef in the, in the world. So if our things are the best and we've been growing them the way we have done them indigenously. 
Can our experts in agriculture find a way of improving what we've been using, like the cow dungs and um, the neem tree spray, to preserve or to, to, to make sure that we don't lose the crop because of some insects, but put the manure and compost that we normally used to do and be the best producers in the world because everybody will be running to, to certain countries to get these organic products. Thank you. That's a very good advice to Madame Fakoy. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Naitwa Peter Marwa. I will ask my question in Swahili. Siku mbali sana na mzungumzaji aliye Peter. Hoja yangu kutokana na maelezo ya kopi ya moderator kitaka kusema kwamba wachangiaji wamsaidie mama kutoka Lesoto kwa mtizamo wake. Lakini Kwa nini tusifikirie pia na sisi kujisaidia kujaribu kuelewa hoja yake? Kwa sababu anazungumzia uh, namna ya kubaki katika hicho substance farming, lakini yeye amezungumzia kwenye commercial farming. Na tukizungumzia kwenye commercial farming, inamana kinachoangaliwa hapo ni upataji wa faida zaidi kuliko dhana nzima ya kilimo kwa maana ya kutupatia chakula kwa sababu mwisho wa siku chochote kile kinachohitajika hata kama tutakikuza kwa kiwango kikubwa kiasi gani lazima kibaki kutuletea yale mahitaji ya msingi ambayo tunahitaji chakula kwa ajili yake sasa kuna dhana ya commercial farming na smart farming sijui kama ni vitu ambavyo vinafanana lakini ukiangalia ni kwamba smart farming inajaribu kukuza kiwango cha uzalishaji bila kubadili aina ile ya uzalishaji. Kwa mfano kama mahindi tukichukulia mahindi sisi ambao tunakula ugali, mmezoea kula ugali ambao haujakobolewa. Sasa ukienda kwenye tunataka smart farming tukuze kiwango hicho kama mtu alikuwa na uwezo kutengeneza labda gunia moja, sasa tengeneze gunia mia moja lakini ikiwa katika hali ile ile ukienda kwenye uh, commercial kuna vitu vingi vitatumika hapo kama hivyo viwatilishi na mbegu zitakazotumika alafu baadaye utaambiwa kwamba unga ule unakobolewa unakula chakula ambacho kimekobolewa na ukienda kwenye commercial pia watakwambia kula mahindi ambayo ni dona sio salama kwa sababu yameshatumia dawa na utajikuta tena unaingia kwenye magonjwa kama kupata kansa. Sasa tuangalia dhana yake hiyo je, hatuwezi kupata hiyo substance farming kwenye smart farming kuliko dhana ile ya commercial farming. Nashukuru. Asante sana tumekupata. Um, sasa because we are running out of time I will, uh, is it really burning, sir? Okay. I'll make it very short, three sure. things or two. The, what I would like to know from, from the SGC uh, colleague is kind of uh, what the problem is, is, is always a certification for, with regard to quality, etc. So even when you work with supermarkets as a small scale farmer, um, that certificate is a problem. Can you do group certifications? Because you, you mentioned that it is possible and that would reduce the cost significantly. Second, same thing, uh, how far are you with certification of seeds? Because there's this ownership of seeds and, and, and using the traditional seeds rather than the commercial ones. How are your thoughts about that? Very good. That's a very short question and that adds value. Okay, the last one, please. Yes, so... My name is Warren, uh, and I work on uh, renewable energy sector. So uh, on the company that we work with, uh, we are working with uh, electrifying local villages, which most of them, their main activity is farming and, and agriculture in general. So uh, we, we, we had some constraints, um, and mainly is 
they were using uh, the substantial farming methodologies, which um, it, it doesn't align with our vision of producing and providing zero uh, carbon emitting energy. So we created a platform where uh, they could get not only best methodologies that they could use on their f um, agricultural activities, but also um, that could give them uh, tips, let's say, of weather and of um, cl the climate changes in general. And there is a plan of also creating a, a, a blockchain platform that will be powered by blockchain, um, where the customers will be uh, linked with the local markets without them finding out, uh, them going uh, in towns to find the markets. So in the Sadek community, uh, targeting the SGS um, presentation. Is there a, a plan of having this kind of platform where it will be powered with, let's say, imaging technologies that will um, kind of uh, first standardize the market and also connect the local farmers with um, different market areas using this platform? So basically, they won't need to, 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 to meet with um, uh, let's say outside uh, markets or even local markets without even moving uh, steps from where they're, 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 they're living, basically. So it will also um, act as a certifier of the products of the farmers. Let's say if uh, the goal is for them to, to, to farm with methodologies that they do not emit greenhouse gases, then the chain for, for them to sell their product on that uh, blockchain system they have to be uh, kind of certified that they are not producing, um, they, they, they're not producing these greenhouse gases or they're not uh, contributing to the um, carbon emission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to give uh, one or two minutes to our speakers to wind up. Just answer the question and wind up very briefly. Karibu. We start with the Dr. Makame. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, one is uh, the issue of, um, I mean, the priority of agriculture. Actually, uh, you will agree with me, so I don't need to speak much about that because uh, <clears throat> this has been slotted the last, but, uh, you know, it was not even uh, announced until the moderator had to intervene. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, give it uh, the, the, the attention it really deserves. And uh, when we come to my brother from uh, Kisarawe, Saidi, uh, Saidi has uh, spoken many issues, but uh, the, to just sum it up is that um, we have a local government in Kisarawe, we have a district commissioner in Kisarawe, and uh, we have uh, initiatives at Kisarawe for, which are catering for local uh, entrepreneurship and production. And uh, we have a very dynamic district commissioner there who would uh, really take this on and uh, see to it that uh, the initiatives that are being proposed by the company are worked on. And uh, much as that has been said now, now let me just uh, wind up by saying issues of overregulation and uh, miss now maybe changing the interpretation of uh, food and uh, cash crops. Because usually in, we used to interpret some items as food crops and others as cash crops. But uh, now we see even food is becoming a cash crop. But uh, we have also food export ban being imposed and there, there was an issue of uh, uncertain policies. So when we impose food export ban, and hindering the farmers to export their production, uh, at times we really discourage their production. But, um, and this is the last one now, Mr. Moderator. When you are talking about uh, subsistence farming, and you're talking about smart agriculture, and you're talking about commercial farming, this may be the same or different. The, the subsistence farming, there's no commerce in it. The commercial farming, it means maybe you are just producing for for, for selling on. But uh, with smart agriculture, it can be for subsistence and it can be for commercial, both, as uh, Mr. Marwa here said. But what you can do is you can have commercial but with subsistence. 
So you have to feed yourself, you have to make sure that you are food secure, but also you sell on the surplus. So you have to make sure that what you are producing, you are producing with greater yield so that you have surplus to sell on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. Thank you, moderator. I would like to comment on the issue of uh, agriculture not being given a priority in the region. That is very true. For an example, from my country, we used to say agriculture is the backbone of the economy of our country. But when it comes to prioritization, it's not priori prioritized as the first priority. It comes the last on the list. So that's the biggest challenge all over in the region. Another thing which I would like to comment on, there was a mention of uh, farmers uh, uh, being doing, uh, signing the contracts, doing contractual farming in some places or in some countries. I don't know whether it's working for them, but for us, it failed, that contractual farming. Because now, at the end, when you failed to produce enough to sell, to pay the loan, you remain with the debt for that somebody you signed a contract with. It's very dangerous. I would say to the farmers, you run away from that. Another thing which I would like to comment on it's about uh, subsistence farming, emitting greenhouse gases. I would say that is not true. If you look at the, at the figures of how much subsistence farming is contributing to the emission of the green houses, gases, it's almost zero compared to other things. It's not subsistence farming. That needs to be corrected. And last but not least, it was a comment from my sister there where she was asking me uh, about uh, if we can ask the experts to help us preserve our indigenous knowledge and our yeah, indigenous knowledge, I would say that is what precisely I was trying to make a point of here. Good. Thank you very much. Go ahead. I think um, all I just quickly want to mention is there's just one thing that we should not overlook, and that is because of population growth and climate change, we need to produce 70% more food by 2050 that we are doing right now. So subsistence farming will not be able to keep up with that. And the next point I want to make is smart farming um, is all about predictive data. It's all about scientific approach. It doesn't mean GMOs. Our company is testing for various GMOs. We are testing for allergens and all kinds of things that are detrimental to people and their health. So at the end of the day, smart farming does not mean we're going the GMO route. Um, last thing is um, the world are focused on quality goods. They want these uh, naturally organic grown products. So if you commercialize that concept, then you give a great product with the same principles as what subsistence farming used to be. And to the gentleman on my right, yes, we do a, do a group approach in terms of testing and trying to group farmers together to make it more affordable and more viable to do all of that testing that is required for the farmer. Thank you. My quick concluding statement would be, starting from the delegations I've participated with, when politicians, the missions, they go to the farmers, and after appreciating a good work, they, what they have done, the concluding remarks are said, and I quote, 
We appreciate farmers that you are working hard and we encourage you to work more harder. End of quote. And here also I've heard the same words as we were going around the booth. I was standing behind some of the delegates and we were encouraging those making displays to say, we appreciate you, you are doing good work. Work hard, work hard. Probably from this session, let's change the message. Let's tell the farmers not to work harder, but rather they should work smarter. And what does that involve? They have to trim the fat. You ask some farmers why they are growing A, B, C, D, or 20 crops, and to them they are just enjoying all those 20 crops. There is no value. Can they be strategic, prioritize, and grow what can help them to move a step forward? But at the same time, let the farmers start measuring the results of what they get, and not only the time. Some farmers challenge you and say, I've been farming for the past 25 years, or oh, 30 years, I've got experience. Then the next question is, how have you moved? There are other indicators you have to measure when you talk of smart agriculture. Food, yes, one of it. Economic values, nutrition, many other elements. So the key message is, let us all support farmers in the investment itself, in the policies itself, to help the farmer to move to smart agriculture. The economy, as he has mentioned, the economy, the world is becoming complex. We're having pressure, different pressures, the population, the economics, the demands of the even consumers. That's where it drives us all to move towards smarter agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, speakers. There is one question that has not been answered and it's very critical. Uh, there is someone from Tanzania who wanted to know if SGS can work with the farmers in Tanzania and help them comply to European market and get certificates as you do, where you do. I think that is exactly why we are here. We want to get involved in crop governing bodies. We are involved in various uh, countries in their crop governing bodies. And yes, they are welcome to have my card and we can discuss it for sure. Uh -huh. So the one who asked the question, please, after the meeting, you can exchange communication so that you carry on the discussion after here. Ladies and gentlemen, time has been very short to discuss all critical issues regarding this important topic. Um, I'm not convinced that we have explored all the critical issues regarding small scale farming and the transformation of small farmers in the region. There are issues that I wanted to know in details, but they didn't come out clearly, but uh, at least uh, our colleague from Maui has mentioned it, the issue of block farming. I, I, I'm not sure if you are familiar with block farming. I'm not talking about blockchain. Blockchain is some kind of new money. I'm not talking about blockchain. I'm talking about block farming. You see, when you have farmers, say, in a 100 hectares, you grow 100 crops, you can't make it. You grow beans, your neighbor is growing cassava, another neighbor is growing uh, sugarcane, another one papaya. And they, when you harvest, you don't, nobody gets enough. I have two cases here. One trader has called me, he wants to buy all groundnuts, any amount of groundnuts that I have. Or if I can connect him with the farmers who can supply him with groundnuts. But there is no any farmer who can go into the contract with this buyer because he needs minimum 40 tons per month. There is no farmer who can supply that. Another one has called me. He wants sunflower. He is ready to enter into contract with the farmers to buy any, sun, any amount of sunflower, but of a certain variety. But there is no farmer. Because farmers have five acre, one acre, two acre, two bags, and so on. Now, through block farming, where you identify a block of farm, where at the moment farmers are growing different crops, you convince them through policies and incentives to put that land under one crop. So that when you bring the machine, like a tractor, you don't have to ask yourself about boundaries. The tractor will just farm the whole block. When it comes to planting, the tractor will plant the whole block. The same applies to weeding and then harvesting. 
Or maybe if you are not in agreement at harvesting, you can say everybody goes to is plotting their vest. You can make, get more crops and money than the current situation. I think that is an area where Sadiq can intervene by asking governments to develop policies that will support block farms for maize, for rice, for cassava, for whatever. And then it is much easier when you have a block like that to go into contract farming. You can contact a buyer and negotiate to sell crops that come from this block of farm. You can go to the bank. The bank will understand that we are borrowing money for this block. Or you can even go for installation of irrigation facilities for the block. Just imagine just one acre someone going to buy irrigation equipment. It won't work. This should come as a policy. These issues, I would have loved, uh, uh, I would have loved to hear them coming up in the discussion. And then we go to contract farming. Time is not enough, as you have said it correctly. The session has been placed at the uh, 11th hour. There is little we can do, but to continue thinking about these things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for active participation. I particularly thank our speakers, who has done a very good job. Thank you very much. Can we put our hands together for them? Thank you so much. We are, there are so many take-home messages from your presentations, from your questions and discussions. I believe the organizers will take these messages on board when establishing resolutions for these sessions. Otherwise, I thank you very much, and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you.